Okay. Well, thank you very much. Javier, I'm afraid you're on mute. Well, I start the game, so no, I was making a mistake. Thank you to all of you, to the audience, to the people who are in Spain, and to my friends who are in Sweden. And I am so happy to replace the president of the Madrid Center of International Arbitration, a new, newly born entity in the world of arbitration, and especially because uh, they have accepted to join the SCC, historic arbitration entity from Stockholm, and uh, to welcome, to organize a joint meeting. The joint meeting looks uh, really very interesting, as you will notice later on. And I was expressing my gratitude and satisfaction because uh, as an, as a former ambassador of Spain to Sweden, I enjoy very much uh, uh, listening the success by the SCC. Uh, presided at the time by the Secretary General, Magnet Magnusson, and now by my also dear friend and my friend, Christine Campbell Wilson. So when I was an ambassador, I mean, one of the most interesting meetings I ever met and I ever had was a dinner organized by the SCC to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. And then when I met these two wonderful women who were doing an extremely powerful job from the SCC. So uh, once I have expressed my satisfaction, I also have the pleasure of, uh, of meeting uh, through the screen some of the, our best experts from Madrid and from Sweden who are going to talk about two very interesting topics. In fact, to tell you the truth, both topics were perhaps according to me, the main issues discussed in our last two Spanish events. We have once a year, I mean, we are not the most powerful country in arbitration, but we do our job. And there was one, the open, I mean, in September, we had the Spanish, uh, there is a club of international uh, Spanish arbitration, and we held uh, an annual Congress. And then in October, we had the open arbitration. And in those two events, the main topics were perhaps, according to me, I was just a listener, a follower, are exactly those topics we are going to discuss. We are going to discuss first digitalization, which is of course a very extremely important issue. And then we are going to discuss energy dispute. Energy dispute have a lot to do with Spain. We have been under many arbitration cases as a, a, a facing a very powerful uh, in entities who, who have expressed their not the satisfaction with some modification we introduce in our legislation. So we have, have suffered this experience, which is very powerful, very interesting for us. So and this for discussing these two issues, we have a four very well prepared experts. Uh, we are going to organize according to, I mean, we agreed, the five of us to organize this in the best way. I am going to stop talking immediately and I am going to start with the first uh, panel which will be dealing with digitalization. For 25 minutes, they will have all the time to express their point of view on this issue, where I know that Christine Campbell Wilson is very powerful because she has been behind as the number two of the SEC at the time, behind two very ambitious programs, which were, had to do with the SEC platform and especially with the SEC Express. So she will have many things to tell us how SEC managed from Stockholm to face I mean, if before the, the pandemics, SEC was ready. So we, we have followed, and I learned from Melanie, who is the number two and the most interesting person behind the Madrid International Center of Arbitration, that in fact, they have followed SEC experience. And in fact, they have joined in some, uh, in some uh, approaches to the issue and in some platform. So it will, make very, it will be very interesting for us to see in which way Madrid and Stockholm are working in the same technological world. So, and after that, uh, we will have the dispute, and I will, at the time, I will in introduce both uh, both panelists. I want only to add 
that, as you know, Christine has a long experience as the SEC. She has been the, the, the number two for many years. And so she, she, she is really an experienced lady in this. She's also an experienced lady in another aspect which I admire very much, uh, dealing uh, is uh, being dealt with by the SEC, which has to be with green arbitration. And I will have to remember <laughs> Anne Marcuson, her friend who has just left SDC and has, she has started a new challenge in the area of <coughs> climate change arbitration. But today she is going to devote, I mean, perhaps there will be an opportunity to talk more about climate change, but she's going to especially explain us how they have managed to, to make use of technological resources to improve the wonderful job being done by SCC. And Melanie, who is just a rival, so they have, we have, we are moving from a very historic uh, arbitration entity in Stockholm to a very new, a very new institution in Madrid. And I would like to, to express to you my satisfaction because I, from the time I was ambassador to Spain, uh, uh, as far as ambassador to Sweden, I learned that one thing we had, a uh, challenge we had, it was to try to unify our many uh, arbitration courts into one international court. And this, I was so happy to see that uh, the four important arbitration courts in Madrid managed to, to deal, to negotiate and sign a very interesting, in fact, in the day of my birth, 18 December, if I am not mistaken, two years ago. And so now Madrid is proud. And that's why they have uh, asked uh, SEC to, to have a joint event. And Melanie was a, a very good choice. I mean, we had to, to, to pick up a, a lady in disguise for uh, the position of Secretary General of the MIAC of the Madrid International Arbitration Court. And we are so happy that uh, Melanie decided to drop her job at the time with one of the most important arbitration office in Madrid, which is a very admired firm from all of us, Fernández Armesto, she left here. She left him, she, I'm, I'm sure he was very disappointed, but she joined uh, MIAC. And uh, so I am so happy that MIAC is going to be present all over and every day is going to make them. So we will start with, with them, with the two of them. I will give the floor to Christine. Then we will have Melanie, and I was asked for Melanie to explain to you that if there are questions, it could be very easily asked. I would, would be grateful if you could ask the question through chat. And Melanie has promised me she will be able to speak, <laughs> to follow the chat, and they will, she will transmit to me. But we will have dialogue at the end of the two panels to, to just to leave these two, these four very prestigious panelists to have their time. And if there is time, we will ask you more questions. So that's all. Thank you to Sweden. Thank you to Madrid. In Sweden, we are having, I think, our king and queen. So it's a very important moment. They are, they yesterday they held the reception to the Spanish colony. And I remember all of them, they were very happy Spanish people living in Estocolm. Well, in Estocolm, some of them came from the south, from Helsingborg no, and Gothenburg. So I am sure it was quite a reception. Thank you to all of you and Christine, you have the floor. Thank you, Javier, and thank you very much um, to uh, the Madrid International Arbitration Center for this um, joint event with the SSC. Very excited to be doing this uh, with you all. So thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Juan and Javier for participating in this event today. Um, like Javier said, we have uh, a limited uh, time uh, for our two panels. So without uh, much further ado, I will try and share my presentation. And just nod if you can see what I'm presenting. Yes, it should be uh, right. So, all right. So um, I have about 10 minutes to speak about uh, the SEC and I will quickly um touch upon uh the history of ssc what we're known for uh and then dive into uh the innovations uh in arbitration that the ssc has has uh, uh been up to uh or come up with in the recent um history so um 
the SEC, as you uh, will know, is a old institution. Let me see if I can find my little arrow. Uh, has been has been around for uh, over a hundred years. It was established in in 1917. And today it is one of the leading international dispute resolution centers and arguably the most modern one, not the youngest, it's quite old, but um, arguably the most modern one. We'll see when we've heard Melanie speak uh, about uh, the work at MIAC as well. Um, but we see about 200 cases registered with the SSC per year. 50% of those uh, cases are domestic arbitrations and 50% are international. And we see approximately 40 countries represented in our statistics every year. Uh, and the majority of those international cases have an east-west characteristic um, to the dispute. A lot of our cases uh, come from the energy sector and we also um, administer investment arbitrations. The majority of the cases or investment arbitrations administered at the SSC are done so under the SSC arbitration rules, but we also act as appointing authority under UNCTRA rules. And to um, highlight the, the key features of um, the SSC uh, is that it is indeed an internationally recognized institution. It is also impartial and independent from uh, the state. It is the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce is a private organization. Uh, and um, over the years, the SSC has been acknowledged as a very innovative and forward leaning institution um, with a strong focus on time and cost efficiency. So take a look at uh, this particular slide where I've um, summed up some of the innovations uh, that the SSC has delivered uh, over the years, um, starting in the 90s with rules for expedited arbitration. Uh, we uh, see a lot of expedited arbitrations at the SSC. It's, I know it is also a very topical uh, question to date um, and uh, very happy to have been a leader in that field as well. One of um, the innovations at the SSC, we see both in terms of procedure and procedural rules uh, and new innovations uh, for um, uh, embedded in our rules, but we also see innovations in terms of the administration and there's where the digitalization comes in. Uh, for the past decade, we've had a strong focus on uh, technology and using technology to enhance uh, efficiency and expeditiousness in our caseload. Um, and using the tools out there, we have, we left the paper trail behind already in 2013 to move to a digital case management system. Um, but the big leap uh, happened in 2019 in this regard when we launched the SSE platform, which is a case management platform um, uh, for the use of um, the institution, uh, the parties, and the tribunal. It is a, a cyber secure um, um, uh, site or virtual room where uh, the parties and the institution can communicate uh, securely. Um, also, just to add, like Javier mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of innovations, we recently launched uh, a completely new dispute resolution uh, tool called the SSA Express. Um, I will, for the sake of time, not dive into this very exciting topic here and now, but would be happy to join you at another occasion to talk more about the SSA Express. But back to the SSC platform. Um, so, the SSC has had uh, a long focus or a focus on digitalization, as I mentioned. Um, when we, we knew for uh, quite some time that this was something that we wanted to, to do, it had been on our list of priorities for a long time, but it didn't uh, get to the top spot until in 2018, when we sat down to discuss what it is that we want to achieve and um, what features and what prerequisites were needed and how we could go about this. And we found that we had uh, four main um, uh, criteria for uh, such a 
case management platform. And first, it had to be relevant to arbitration proceedings. Um, it had to have all the features that would be required for administrating uh, arbitration proceedings in an efficient way, uh, and not very much else. There are a lot of different uh, products out there, and um, we were very mindful of choosing a product that was not um, too busy. Uh, it was very important to have a simple interface and uh, an easy, easy look um, uh, and an interface to um, meeting our users. Um, and that has to do with user friendliness. It needed to be user friendly. Uh, it needed to be uh, easily understood. It needed to cater for both the young and the old and the tech savvy and the not so tech savvy uh, people in our industry. That was very important. And of course, cybersecurity was another aspect that was highly um, uh, important as it was uh, one of the main reasons why we wanted to achieve this in the first place. Uh, and fourthly, it needed to be um, included in the administrative uh, fee of the institution uh, as we want our users to, um, to use the platform. Uh, and that was very important that there was not going to be any other threshold um, or point of discussion for parties whether or not to use the platform uh, for the administration of the, of the case. So uh, we achieved uh, exactly that. And this is uh, one of our... Um... Sorry, I hear someone talking. Um, yes, so this is a uh, sneak peek of uh, what it would look like if you enter the SSC platform. Uh, it has the main functions. Um, Melanie will recognize uh, our platform from, from uh, uh, MIAC's platform and how it's built up. Um, but this um, is the tool that we've used since September 2019, uh, and very successfully so. We were lucky to launch it um, prior to the pandemic. It was, uh, you know, very, very lucky and, and uh, um, a strange, strange thing um, uh, to be entering the pandemic, but with this already in place, uh, which helped our case, our cases a lot and our case managers um, not to uh, um, uh, lose any speed in, in the case administration as such. We've seen uh, more than, uh, we have uh, more than 5,000 uh, active participants in our cases. We've seen uh, 500 cases uh, registered on the platform since September, 2019. Currently, we have 231 cases ongoing. Um, of the 5,500 or so um, users that uh, we see in our cases, uh, about 2,000, uh, 2, um, 2,100 uh, are unique users. So we have a lot of repeat customers in that sense. Um, and it is possible to um, um, upload a lot of documents, um, but uh, as an estimate uh, or an average, we have about 200, uh, 2,000 files uploaded in each uh, site or arbitration. So um, with this experience, uh, and as I said, we were lucky to have this already in place uh, when the pandemic hit in, in uh, mid uh, well, in the spring of 2020, uh, we did notice that our friends in the industry who were active in ad hoc arbitrations were not uh, were, were struggling in the sense that they did not have any support of any institution and found themselves in lockdown. So what we did was um, we teamed up with our supplier, um, which was Haiku, um, uh, then later purchased by Thomson Reuters, to create the ad hoc platform. Uh, and this is a sister platform, which is basically a mirrored um, uh, instance of the SSE platform, but it is available for uh, ad hoc proceedings uh, uh, across the globe. So it has nothing to do with Sweden or the SSC. Other than that, we we um, uh, offer it to ad hoc proceedings uh, as a cybersecure uh, space 
for um, handling such cases. And as you can see, it has a very similar look to the SEC, um, but of course, uh, there is no, no uh, communication uh, with the SEC as we are not administrating any of those cases. Um, that is uh, very quickly about the uh, digital innovations of late uh, at the SEC, but I could also finish off by saying that um, I know that at least 15 other institutions are looking into developing their own uh, platforms uh, currently, uh, which only tells us that this is the right path forward. This is where arbitration will be taking place to a great extent, uh, with or without a pandemic. This is the path uh, for arbitration going forward. Um, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions or uh, discuss further with Melanie after her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you to you. We are so happy to learn that from 1995, when you already used the word expedient arbitration, you have moved forward and we are having now the SEC platform and the ad hoc platform. So congratulations for the good work done. And now I give the Thank floor you. to Melanie, who I'm sure she has great ideas on her mind also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Javier, um, can you see my, my yeah. screen? Great, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Javier, for your, your very generous and kind uh, words. Um, and uh, for me, it's, uh, it's an honor, and for, for MIAC, it's an honor to be sharing this seminar um, with SCC. And thank you so much, Kristen, to share uh, this uh, first panel with me and, and MIAC. Um, it's really an honor to, ha to, to have uh, this um, long track record institutions such as SCC, so thank you. Um, as regard the MIAC, the Madrid International Arbitration Center started operating in January 2020. Uh, it is the result of the union of three important courts in Spain, the Madrid Court of Arbitration, the Spanish Court of Arbitration, and the Civil and Commercial Court of Arbitration. MIAC has also, um, also counts with the Madrid Bar Association as a strategic uh, partner. So as you can see, and as um, Javier and Kristen mentioned, we are a very young uh, institution. The mission of MIAC is to offer a service of the highest uh, standard to resolve international commercial disputes in a time and cost efficient manner. So the institution monitors the case from the very beginning of the proceeding. Um, so regarding, for example, the, let me just, Regarding uh, the appointment of, um, of arbitrator, MIAC encourages for the parties to appoint arbitrators. And if they fail to do so, then um, MIAC counts with an independent appointment committee, which carefully selects arbitrators. Um, at the very end of the procedure, MIAC also counts with the committee that reviews the award um, prepared by the arbitrators to ensure the highest quality. So this committee, as you can see on the screen, comprises 24 external members appointed by the council. These are external members um, um, and are professionals of renowned prestige in, in the arbitration community. They're fully independent from MIAC and they receive no remuneration um, for their task. So MIAC was born um, in a digital era. Uh, we all know that the 21st century has shifted from the industrial revolution to the command of information technology where digital technologies such as cloud computing, mobile devices, um, virtual reality play a prominent role in shaping up the behavior of, um, of societies, of organization and uh, of individuals. And of course, arbitration is no exception. So, when, when we started MIAC and when we were brainstorming about what kind of institution we wanted, um, what were the best practices, uh, what would uh, our culture be as an institution, of, as an arbitral institution, what were our purposes, we knew that the use of technology had to be one of our priorities. Being a 21st century arbitration institution, MIAC strives for efficiency using technology. And um, this, I think we can, we can see it or we can witness it in two different levels. First, in our offices, and second, in the case management. So um, regarding the, our offices, um, 
I remember like 10 years ago, I read a, a book that was written by Bill Gates and Colin Hemingway, Hemingways. And um, it was titled Business at the Speed of Thought. And you probably know this book. Um, basically, they give insight on how to integrate business processes with technology. And they explain how advances in information technology can make um, a difference in, in a day-to-day -day, uh, business. And one example of that was the paperless office. So I thought at that time, 10 years ago, I thought it was really a, a chimera, right? But nowadays we, we, have, um, we can see that this has become a palpable reality. Um, we actually, if you think about it, we don't use paper letters anymore, we use emails. We, we don't use paper agendas anymore. We use uh, Outlook calendars, at least for most of us. <laughs> um, and I actually almost never use my handwriting anymore. So almost everything can be done through digital devices, um, which has considerably reduced the, the need for paper. In our office, MEX specifically, um, I can use uh, my task as an example. I All my meetings are, almost every meeting that I have is virtual because whenever I have to uh, meet with my team, it's virtual because every single responsible is in the different courts that, um, Compose me because I, as I mentioned, every time I have a meeting with the commission uh, that appoints arbitrators, it is a virtual meeting because they are um, one is in Portugal, the other one is in the United States, uh, etc. Uh, every time I meet with the members of the Commission of Scrutiny, uh, they would be um, anywhere in the world. So most of our of our meetings are virtual, um, and this actually. Um, Probably the, the, the best example that I can give is that I carry my office in my purse every day because I just need my computer, my cell phone, and a good uh, internet access. Um, so this is this is this speaks volumes about uh, how we can use technology to work. Uh, we have also used a lot the QR codes uh, for business cards, for example. Um, many of you, at least uh, on my side, I would use the QRs that are in the LinkedIn. Uh, so every time I, I need to, to give my information, I would go to the LinkedIn and I would show my QR and you can add me to your LinkedIn profile. Uh, and so, so that, uh, that um, means that I, I don't need to use paper anymore. If, um, if I speak, for example, about flyers and in the screen, on the screen, you can see um, the QR code and I will let it there just for you to, if you have a cell phone, you can go into that QR and you can go directly to our flyer. Um, so this has been uh, some resources, technological resources that we have been using uh, in MIAC uh, on the office level, as I mentioned. Now, regarding the case management, um, we try to reduce at its minimum the use of paper in the proceedings. So most of our communication, almost all our communications are digital, digital except for rare except occasions or exceptions. Um, we have, of course, uh, used virtual hearings. Uh, we have a protocol for virtual hearings, and of course, the digital digital platform uh, to handle proceedings. Um, so, actually, international arbitration was not unfamiliar to digital technologies, uh, but we can all agree that um, not many institutions made good use of this technology before. COVID-19. So COVID-19 has really accelerated this fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and now uh, the most important institutions have caught up with digital technologies. So the bad news for MIAC is that uh, it could not be as in, um, in innovator or, or disruptive as we want it. Um, we can say that actually the pandemic has stolen uh, uh, MIAC's thunder. Um, nonetheless, every cloud has a silver lining. And I can mention two positive aspects. The first one is that this has encouraged the institution to work harder to compete in a very demanding field. And the second uh, aspect that I can mention that is positive is that the arbitration community has been amazing adapting to uh, the new conditions, the, the post COVID conditions. So the pandemic has taught us to be flexible and adaptable. And I think that is very good news for the arbitration field. So let's go uh, to the digital platform. Actually, um, MIAC has the same platform of um, SCC. 
this is the HiQ Thomson Reuters platform, uh, which provides a secure digital environment where the participants and the um, the well, all the participants of an arbitration proceeding uh, can exchange communication and store uh, the evidence and the file of their proceedings. When we started looking for uh, for a different platform, we thought this one really accommodated to our users' needs, and 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 it gave what what gave us a strong green light, let's say like that, is um, was that such a prestigious institution such as the SEC already had it in place. Um, they were actually pioneers, I think, uh, in, in in this field. So. I, I, um, I would not go into the details of the platform because, of course, Kristen has already mentioned it. Um, but what we were looking for in, in NIAC is um, to have a, a user-friendly platform um, to show it in an efficient and practical and useful way. So um, what I'm going to, what, what basically our experience um, with this platform has been very good. I, I have to admit that actually we're as I mentioned, uh, MIAC is a, is a very young institution. We, we have reached the 10th case. Uh, so we all, all, all only have 10 cases, but all our cases have been um, administered through the platform. So most of the cases have been, um, we, we didn't have any problem with the, um, with the parties or with the tribunal. We have some exceptions and we, uh, these uh, very honestly, I think that there are some parties still, or some arbitrators even, that are reluctant to, to use the platform. Uh, there is still a little resistance to change. Um, so I can see that in, in one of our cases, at least, the rest, uh, I think it has been uh, flawless, but in one of our cases, I've seen that they use the platform, they would upload all the, the, the communications, but they will still be sending the communications through email. Um, so. I think um, we have to, to be, um, as an institution, let's call it technical evangelists, um, and, and try to, to put on um, many best practices to make users at ease with the platform. So what we have done so far is, first of all, what we do is that every time a case starts, we have a phone call with all the participants to set up the profile and to explain uh, how the platform works. We have included a guideline too, um, for, for every user or every um, party or members of the tribunal to be, um, to be very clear on how the platform works and to help them if they have any, any, any problem with the platform. And of course, you have the contact details of the case managers in case you have any questions regarding uh, the platform. So um, at the end is a matter, I think, of, uh, of building trust. And I'm, I'm just going to finish with... Um, with this, um, I'm gonna show you very, very quickly how the platform works. So actually what we do here is on the first page, uh, we will show who is the claimant, who is the respondent, and the main characteristics or the main features of the, of the arbitration. Um, so any party can go into, log in into their, their, their case and they can see those characteristics very quickly. Um, so this helps a lot with efficiency and this is another, the chronology of the procedure, and this is another um, item that I, I would love to, to mention, is that we have to give predictability and certainty to uh, the users. So actually this procedural chronology, what, what gives us is that they already know what happened in the procedure, where do we stand right now, and where are we going? So if you look at the very end, you will see an, um, in orange letters, we always have next steps. So next steps, not only in the platform, but next steps in every of our communications, we have the next steps. Um, so this allows the parties to know what has happened in the case, where are we, and what's gonna happen in the case. And this, I think, gives a lot of predictability and certainty. So if a party, for example, cannot reach um, its, its counsel, its lawyer, it can just go through the platform and have all the, the information of the case um, and uh, have this uh, predictability or certainty that, that I think users, um, users need. And then we have, of course, a section where um, you have uh, the claimants, the respondents, the arbitral tribunal, and the people that is working in your case. So there's really a closeness to the user. You know who is behind the institution. And of course, you have the contact details because 
there's nothing worse than uh, trying to contact someone, uh, looking on the web page, there's no phone, there's no email, you don't know what's happening with your case. So actually, um, I think this is uh, these are little tips that will help the users to be confident that um, what's happening in the procedure in the procedure, and if they have any question, just call or or send an email. Um, so basically, uh, just to finish, I think that um, to build this trust, like this platform, really has helped us to to build this trust, and we're still working on that. Um, and I think you get trust with time and cost efficiency, predictability and certainty, and of course, um, accessibility and closeness to the user. So um, this is all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think uh, Jose Antonio Caín, whom I am replacing, will be very happy with your presentation because you have insisted on his most important point of trying to have uh, MIAC as a very technological and advanced uh, arbitration center. So I, I'm, I'm sure you both will be strengthening cooperation between Madrid and Sweden on the issue because out of Christian's experience and your uh, enthusiasm about this, in fact, I was, I was coming today in the morning from a meeting where I was uh, listening again, as you know, we have problem with justice in Spain in the sense that it is almost blocked because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, international arbitration in Spain is doing well. It's quite technologically, it's as good as could be some other centers in, all over the world. Uh, fortunately, I learned that in, on the contrary, domestic arbitration in Spain was not so, 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 so technologically advanced. Uh, on the contrary, as Christine has explained to us, fortunately, SEC is working both 50-50 with domestic and, and international arbitration, which is something I am sure Jose Antonio, the president of MIAC, is dreaming of. So thank you to you, both of you. And I will move I mean, forward. I mean, before, before me, sorry for interrupting, but maybe I can, I can give you um, a piece of information about this uh, regarding the national, um, the national arbitration. We actually... Good. The, uh, all our, our our courts, the founding the founding courts, have adopted this system too. So this is a very good news because it's not and only that's very good news. Yeah, that, thanks a lot. But also, but also the four courts that um, I'm going. I'm happy you are following a, a Stockholm example. I'm so happy. No, yes, I'm going to move forward to the second panel. We have more or less the same time. I, I really want to praise uh, and thank uh, Juan Ignacio presence here. I mean, I am just, as you know, I'm just almost a student. I mean, a, a very veteran student in arbitration. And I remember I have listened to him in several past occasions. In fact, I have in front of me when I attended the very interesting meeting, the Renewable Energy and Investment Arbitration. That was February 21. And uh, he was uh, sharing the, the floor with Eduardo Silva, with Ricardo Ampuero, with Deva Villanua are perhaps three of the best known names together with him in what we would say the in-house arbitration world. And so he's quite an expert. In fact, he has a quality which is not so common in the <laughs> legal world. He is very, very, very coherent. I mean, he has almost spent 34 years with uh, Uriah. How many years have you been? In? Well, I know you are very young, but I mean, you started in 99, 98, no? So one of our best legal office in Spain is Uriah, and he has been a partner, I mean, 10 years after he joined it, but he has been a partner for many years, and he has devoted really most of his many hours of work to investment uh, arbitration. So I'm sure that he will uh, tell us interesting things. I will remind him that Spain has been a defendant most of the time. <laughs> Uh, so, and now, and then we have, uh, thanks to Christine, we have a, a legal expert uh, who is uh, from uh, SCC. And I read, in fact, that he has been started young. He's almost very young, but he started as a clerk with the, uh, the law clerk at the district court. I remember when I was asked after coming back from uh, Sweden by a friend who was an arbitrator, Javier, could you translate to me Svea? I, I was very happy because I had no idea <laughs> which level of uh, judicial uh, court was fair. But then I learned 
And now I know that since you are coming from this area, judicial area, Christopher, you, you know, and you will tell us many things about this dispute, energy dispute. So thanks to both of you. And I will give the floor to Juan Ignacio, and then we will listen to you. And if we have time, we will have some questions and answers. Thank you very much, Juan Ignacio. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much, Javier, um, for your introduction. I hate to be uh, a party a party popper, but um, my job, frankly, is trying to avoid that um, we need to use either um, court of arbitration. I mean, my job is precisely trying to get parties to agree on contracts, on transactions, and trying to avoid litigation. But, um, you know, obviously we are aware of, of facts and, and uh, as much as we'd like uh, things to move uh, nicely, um, you know, we, we, we have to realize that fights, problems, disputes arise, no matter what the lawyers do. And, and of course, as lawyer, as a practitioner, I want to believe that we do our out, outmost to, to try to avoid going to, uh, to arbitration uh, and litigation. But in, in my particular area of expertise, energy um, disputes are bound to happen, unfortunately. And um, there are several reasons for that. And I'll try in my slide to, to, to deal and, and to give a, a very summary overview as to why it is the case. Um, this is a typical energy project structure that you can't easily find, find in the internet. Um, this is the archetypical simplified structure of a large energy project. You are bound to have, you know, uh, the different parties, which I've, I've tried to um, underline with a gray color, uh, uh, the almost the outer circle. And uh, you have contracts, again, a simplified fashion in uh, green in the inner circle. Um, one thing that is common to many of the energy projects, or, or in fact, five features that are common to energy projects are, are set out in, the, in that column on, on, my, on the right hand of the screen. First feature is, of course, that these are capital intensive projects. So there's loads of capital involved. So therefore, the potential for disputes is huge. I mean, you're not talking typically peanuts. You're talking millions, euros, dollars, whatever. So the potential for conflicts is, of course, there. But um, energy is also a very uh, international area of business. Um, it is very, very common that energy projects will involve different countries either because um, you know the projects themselves are located or there are inputs coming from different countries just think of a power station where gas may be coming from all over the world or from particular jurisdictions and uh, even a power station may be selling electricity to different uh, or in different markets or certainly to parties from different backgrounds so there are different contracts different parties international parties and uh, again in many of these contract in many of these projects of course uh, contracts have a long term uh, a long term duration be it construction contract be it the supply contract be it the the ppa or, or or just the the hedging agreements in place you name it there's bound to be uh, contracts that will stand for several years so again the potential for conflict as needless to say increases year on year and finally but not by any means the uh, the, the the list of, of our concerns this is typically a highly regulated environment um, energy in any market in any country is a highly regulated environment where you have different layers of authorities be it because they are competent for building permits or be it for in, in industry permits for operation or at the end of the day by governments from the countries involved uh, and of course governments as we all know particularly in this country in spain they do have an important role to play they can interfere and they can become themselves uh, the the subjects of of many claims and disputes so um energy unfortunately is probably one of the um I, i'm sure christopher will give us the, the data later on on scc 
um, uh, record of, uh, of disputes. But energy is, of course, bound to be one of the most popular sources of disputes in any international arbitration environment. So, um, what? Which are the features, though, the considerations that I've put in, in, in this slide will uh, play a role when we are advising parties in, in, in agreements. And either we have to provide our input or our views as to should we go for arbitration or go for jurisdiction process. And typically, again, as you, as you can imagine, I'm sure you've come across this before, um, these clauses tend to be at the very end of the contract. So by the time you get there, you spend hours on, on, on end disputing and fighting every single corner of the contract. And gosh, here comes the arbitration versus jurisdiction process. And um, that's the very first hurdle that you have to overcome. Should we go for arbitration? Should we go for jurisdiction? If we go for arbitration, which uh, system, which institution, which proceedings shall we use? So um, when approaching these issues, um, definitely the first one, to be honest, in my mind, has always been the complexity of contracts. Uh, the more complex the contract is, uh, the higher the chances are, I would say, let's go for arbitration. Um, and in this industry, contracts tend to be horribly complicated, not only because it's a contract in itself, you know, long-term supply agreements, EPC contracts, all of them are enormously complex, but they are even more complex if you need to put them in a framework where you are looking into an energy project and you have to take into account the, the interests or the interface of, of different contracts and different parties. So uh, clearly, uh, say, go for local courts, local judges, uh, unless they are really um, people who have first-hand expertise in this industry, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say or hard to recommend a client, well, yeah, you, you can certainly go to a court because the judges will understand these contracts and will, of course, be familiar with intricacies of these contracts in the context of a large energy project. So clearly, point one for arbitration, needless to say, Secondly, um, different jurisdictions evolve. We said earlier that uh, you know, energy projects tend to be very international. Every counterparty that you'll come across will, of course, try to argue for their own laws. And needless to say, even if they, if they lose that battle, uh, they, they, they'll try to stick to steel, to, um, particularly if, if the project is located um, you know, in any particular country because of power station or facilities that to be built in that particular country, of course, the sponsors will, will fight their corner trying to argue for local courts. Needless to say, um, if you are operating in emerging markets, uh, more frequently than not, uh, you'll have an easy point trying to argue out of the, of, of the jurisdiction of local courts. Sometimes, needless to say, there are issues and there are matters that you can't avoid having the, the local courts adjudicate on those matters. But to the extent that you do have some room, that you do have some, some choice, you'll try to walk your way out of, of, of the use of, of local courts. And as I said, unfortunately, but this is a fact, there's no um, judge, judgmental opinion here, is, is that um, uh, you know, there's a flight from, from local jurisdiction in, in, in emerging markets to international arbitration. Thirdly, um, language. Language is an issue and is, is an important issue uh, when you are confronting uh, the choice between arbitration and tribunals. Most of these countries, these, uh, most of, uh, of, of these contracts these days are negotiated and drafted in English. Um, right or wrong is the international, you know, it's the language for international business. And um, in most cases and certainly my experience even if you are pursuing a, con a, a project contract a, a project an energy project in spain um you're bound to have contracts that are drafted in english and negotiated in english even if the governing language uh, the governing law sorry is uh, spanish law so um you will have negotiated drafted uh, these contracts very very carefully and parties will have spent hours 
looking into every um, sentence, every word that is used. And of course, the last thing you want to do is to have those contracts submitted to someone, to a court in Madrid, say, uh, uh, again, no, um, you know, no negative uh, connotations here, but to a judge who is probably not uh, extremely used, let's put it that way politely, to review contracts in English and to use um, uh, legal English in, 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 you know, in analyzing the conflicts, in analyzing solutions, and even drafting its own judgment. So, um, at, at least in, in this country, unfortunately, you know, courts uh, need contracts to be translated. And um, let's say, um, <laughs> in Italian, I think it is, tra um, traduttore, traditore. So, translator is a, is a traitor. Um, and of course, there's always bound to, uh, to go off some shade of color, you know, no matter what, no matter how good your translation is, um, something gets lost in, in, in the process. So again, another reason for uh, arguing for arbitration. Then, needless to say, um, you are seeking protection from local governments, and not only in emerging markets, or you may have to seek that protection, not only in, in emerging markets, and um, Again, unfortunately, in this country, in Spain, we do have um, a not tremendously successful um, track record of avoiding international arbitration from investors complaining against uh, the Kingdom of Spain. So, um, it, uh, BIT, bilateral international treaties or international treaties, such as the, the, the European chart, um, uh, the energy, um, sorry, the energy uh, tr uh, chart uh, treaty, those will come to, um, to the fore very quickly. And as you know, the issues of fair treatment, non-discrimination, no undue expropriation will come to the top of our, of our minds. So again, uh, their investors will look carefully um, whether to pursue their action in local courts or whether to go for international arbitration. Um, an important consideration as well, uh, when you are looking into uh, this, you know, late hour discussions as to, you know, whether we go for arbitration or courts is confidentiality. And, um, and it's one of the features that I like the most about arbitration that is confidential. And, um, you know, you go to war um, or uh, when, um, when you are in arbitration, but at least that war is kept um, under a blanket and it's confidential, um, you know, the market uh, would not get to know um, what's going on, um, well, most of the time, um, and the details, the, 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 uh, the dispute itself will be kept um, confidential, and that is absolutely key. Um, you could argue that the same happens in many courts, uh, but um, frankly, experience shows that um, that is not the case uh, in most cases, in most um, of our experiences. Expediency of proceedings, needless to say, comes to the fore, and sometimes, you know, parties may have different views or different interests here. Some parties may actually like uh, proceedings to go on for years and years. But, um, you know, if you have business-minded people, um, you know, go for some experiency, some, you know, having a, a sort of, and we all know that international arbitration, you know, deadlines are flexible um, uh, and uh, sometimes are difficult to control, but boy, they're far more um, approachable, far more reliant than if you are in the hands of courts. Um, again, also judging and coming from our local experience in, in many of the countries where we operate, um, where of course, duration of proceedings is an issue and it's something that you need a, a quick solution in many of the disputes when you are developing, constructing, or operating uh, an energy project. And finally, um, you know, once you've made your point as to, you know, you've parties to an agreement have reached the consensus that we should go for international arbitration, then there is the issue, okay, well, but that then, which court do we use? And um, what, 
what uh, Kristin and Melanie have just explained before me is absolutely uh, nice. Uh, and I'm delighted to hear how expedient, how easy these proceedings are, how, you know, the rules, the, 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 um, how convenient both um, set of, of proceedings are for uh, practitioners and for parties. But I think um, we also look at, um, you know, some of the, of the elements that I've just outlined there. It's a track record of international institutions. And we look at the reputation, of course, of our availability of experts, the rules, well, the established rules are, rely, uh, are reliable rules and rules are known uh, to practitioner. Costs, uh, needless to say, it, it does play a role. And location. Um, and as you know, again, one of the most heated debates ever uh, when you come to these clauses is where the seat of arbitration needs to be. Uh, and you'll spend, again, hours uh, on end trying to come to an agreement on location. And finally, you know, overall, the, the market acceptance of, of, of the institutions. So clearly, um, you know, um, SEC and um, MIAC are growingly uh, on some of the other courts that Melanie was referring to as founding courts of arbitration for MIAC are, um, are venues and institutions that we have used and um, are very well known in many of the, the international arbitration cases that um, we have uh, been involved in. So um, that, uh, you know, those institutes, I'm, I'm sure, will be top of our list when we come to um, negotiate these clauses again in any of our deals uh, shortly. So um, without further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to Christopher uh, so that he can give us the, um, the, the views from the SEC when it comes to these disputes uh, in the energy uh, field. Christopher. Thank you, Juan Ignacio. Thanks a lot. I enjoy very much your English. It seems your, your many years in London have uh, done a lot. Uh, I enjoy to see a Spanish lawyer with a certain common law approach. So I was happy that your presentation was very good. And now I give the floor to Christopher. And I, since he is the younger, I will be, ask him to try to make a little short, shorter his presentation, just to have some minutes for some to try to answer some of the questions. But before that, I want to mention that he's a young uh, uh, practitioner, but he has picked up two areas where he has a big future, a great future. He's an expert in union arbitration, which I think he made a very good choice. And then he's also very active in the search committee of the Equal Representation and Arbitration Pledge, something I learned recently. And I have understood that he plays quite an important role. In fact, I listened to a Spanish colleague of yours, Elena Gutierrez, who is now an arbitrator in, in Paris. And she recently, I listened to her speak in a about this pledge, which is very important. So this uh, seems that you will have a, a great future, I, uh, I'm sure. And so you have the floor and you try to make it a little shorter to have Melanie to, to help us to say, to ask some questions and try to answer. Thank you very much, Christopher, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Javier, and thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Juan, for opening up this panel with uh, some very interesting and insightful points. Uh, I have a presentation as well. I will try to keep it a bit shorter as per your request, Javier, but uh, I will try to share the presentation as a start. Can you see it now? Yes. You might want to put it in, in display mode. Oh, is it not in display mode? No. Oh. Yeah, let's see. You can stop sharing and try again. Yeah, let's do that. It's always. So now it should be in display mode. All right. So what I'm are, sure that 
I'm sure that's okay. You can go. Yeah, on, you're, sure. you're seeing the slides at least. I, I yes, think that's the important the part. <laughs> okay, that is right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Go on. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So, so thank you again, Juan, for, for opening up the floor. I think what I will be saying will be tying in with, uh, with what you said as well um, to, to some degree. But what I will try to do is to share the institutional's perspective and, and of course, specifically the perspective of the SEC on energy disputes. Um, and by, by way of sort of a general background, and as Christine mentioned, uh, energy disputes have formed a very important part of the SSE caseload for a very long time. And I would also dare to say that this is probably holds true for a lot of major arbitral in institutions as well. Uh, because in fact, energy arbitrations is commonly referred to as one of the fields that have contributed most to the growth of arbitration and international arbitration uh, as a form of international dispute resolution. And as Juan mentioned, arbitration is indeed oftentimes a very suitable form for dispute resolution for energy disputes due to the complexities and, and the size of the disputes. Uh, but besides from the energy sector being an important driver for arbitration historically, it is likely that energy disputes will continue to be important for arbitration and arbitral institutions for the foreseeable future. Because what we see is that the energy sector is constantly growing due to a steady uh, global demand for electricity, uh, which is caused by, by uh, a growth of the global population, growing economies and technological advances. And I think that the energy sector is and will continue to be an important driver for arbitration and for institutions, not only because they represent a big part of uh, the caseload of arbitral institutions, but also because the, uh, as we have mentioned, the amount in dispute will usually be quite high due to energy projects being uh, capital intensive and uh, also very complex. But proceeding then to look at the role that arbitral institutions such as the SSC play in regards to energy disputes, the overall mission of the SSC is to facilitate trade and business by providing a neutral venue for dispute resolution by providing tools that fits the developing needs of the business community. And keeping this overarching objective of the SSC in mind, the importance of a well-functioning energy sector really cannot be overstated. Because, of course, access to energy, it, it says itself really, is, of course, crucial in our modern world and a requirement to keep our modern society running and keeping our, our light bulbs lit. And I do believe that arbitration and institutions have an important role to play when it comes to facilitating, uh, facilitating business trade and investments in this particular sector. Uh, and another aspect that, that needs to be considered uh, when examining the role of arbitration and arbitral institutions in the energy sector is, of course, climate change and the transition to renewable energy. Because at the same time as the demand for electricity is increasing globally, there is, of course, a pressing change uh, or pressing need for change uh, of the way that energy is produced and uh, also consumed. So in this regard, we can see that arbitration uh, plays a uh, role in contributing to the sustainable uh, development objectives by providing an appropriate venue to resolve green technology and in particular uh, renewable energy disputes. So from this sort of general background, I think that it follows directly that an important task of the SEC and also their arbitral institutions when it comes to energy disputes is to provide rules and institutional frameworks which work well for energy disputes and makes it possible to resolve these disputes in an efficient and expeditious manner. But before looking to how institutional tools and rules can do that, I think that it could be of interest to have a look at um, the SSC caseload to see what kinds of energy disputes we see and to what extent. So then I'm trying to proceed to a new slide, and I hope that the uh, this screen has changed for you as well. It didn't? Not did. Yeah. Not did. Let's see. Let me try to share that again then. Let's see if. You might want to put it in slide mode before you start sharing, and then you can pick the the window. There Maybe, you go. Is this better? Yes, much better. Perfect. So then I will proceed. Uh, so first off, looking to the causes of the energy disputes administered by the SSC, uh, I believe that these can be 
quite generally sorted into the categories that we see on this slide. So first off, we have pricing disputes, which will often be a bit different from regular disputes because they are perhaps not as adversarial at the outset as many other forms of disputes. They will often be concerned with whether uh, a trigger event has occurred uh, that actualizes price revision. Then we have disputes concerning non-payment, which of course are a bit more similar to other commercial arbitrations, and it goes for both pricing and non-payments disputes that these will usually be seen in uh, commercial cases rather than investment cases. But proceeding to the second category, we have disputes which fall within the realm of investment disputes, and these are disputes caused by uh, for example, regulatory changes such as uh, alleged elimination of incentive schemes or increased taxation by a state. And one thing that might be especially interesting to note here is that the SSC um, is actually one of the three possible forms appointed in the Energy Charter Treaty uh, for investment disputes uh, under the ECT. Then the third category on this slide is that we have disputes arousing out of a failure or alleged failure to cooperate under a complex energy agreement. And in this broad category, category we, we often find energy disputes of a more general contractual nature. Uh, and this can concern, for example, failed deliveries and, and other contractual disputes. Proceeding to look at some data and numbers here uh, and looking closer on what types of cases we see in the SEC case load. On this slide, we see the um, proportions really of the types of energy cases that we have seen in the case load since 2001. And what we see on this slide is that the majority of cases are contract based energy disputes. So that is cases not based on uh, investment protection treaties, but rather on commercial contracts. Then we have about 15% of the cases being either uh, cases based on the Energy Charter Treaty or brought by investors under, under bilateral investment treaties. And continuing on the track of statistics, we see on this slide which particular energy industry segment that our cases have concerned once again since 2001. Um, and what we will usually see, because of course this, these proportions changes from, from year to year, but what we will usually see is that oil, gas and electricity related disputes tend to be represented in the approximate same proportions, uh, perhaps as you can see on this slide with a, a slight inclination to, to gas disputes. Uh, and then we have a smaller segment uh, with where other industries are involved. So as you have seen and gathered from these slides, uh, the SEC has gotten quite accustomed to, to administrating energy disputes over the years. So the next logical question then becomes, what have we learned from this administration? Uh, and on this slide, I have tried to list some of the main features that we can usually discern in the energy cases that we see in our caseload. And, uh, these factors, I think, ties in quite well with, with uh, what Juan said earlier in his presentation and uh, his observations of the characteristics of energy disputes. Because first off, we see uh, that there is usually a high amount in dispute involved due to energy projects being uh, big in scale, capital intensive, and as we saw on Juan's slide, also quite complex uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, due to the scale and value involved in the energy projects, you also see that the cases are complex, as I mentioned, which is then associated with big volumes of documentations. And this is both in terms of party submissions and in terms of evidence, which is oftentimes quite technical as well. Uh, on the same theme, we can also see that, uh, as Juan also mentioned, uh, that usually the uh, subject matter in dispute will involve quite uh, long-term uh, contracts or, or agreements, um, which oftentimes adds to the complexity as well. And I would say that the main lesson that can be drawn by arbitral institutions here is to have a well-developed institutional framework. And one part of this is to have rules that can really accommodate the procedural complexities that follows from the, the complex and often technical nature of energy disputes. Um, and also to have a strong institutional practice of applying those rules. 
And a clear example of, of, of this type of rules can be rules regarding, for example, consolidation of cases, joinder of the third parties, and whether claims brought under multiple agreements shall be allowed to proceed in a single arbitration. Uh, because rules such as this really uh, allows the, the, um, the institutional practice to reflect the reality of energy cases, which will oftentimes include uh, multi-party elements. Another aspect, or another example, might be rules concerning the uh, the use of technical experts. Uh, the second part of having a well-developed institutional framework is to have a case administration in place, which allows for the efficient and expeditious administration of large and complex disputes. And I think that the clearest and best example of this, uh, which I also see in my, my daily work at the SSC, is the usage of the SSC platform. Uh, because this really, this is the tool which really makes it easier for uh, the parties, the tribunal, and the SSC to handle large volumes of documentation in a safe and reliable manner. And having a, a common case file which grants an oversight uh, on the dispute, I think the, the value of that can hardly be, be overstated. So those are some takeaways. And uh, being conscious of the time, I am approaching the last slide here of my presentation, uh, because I noticed in the, in the invitation to this event that uh, we were also asked to talk a bit about trends in energy arbitration. And I think that one trend that is quite uh, safe to speculate in, and, and which I have already touched upon a bit, is uh, dispute concerning green technology, and in this context, uh, specifically uh, renewable or green energy. Uh, and I think that this is a sector that arbitration and arbitral uh, institutions will be seeing more of. Um, to dive a bit deeper in this uh, subject, still being conscious of the, the, the time, I just wanted to mention that the SEC has actually published a report in 2019, which is written by one of our previous uh, legal counsel concerning uh, green technology disputes at the SEC. Uh, and I think that that might be that report might be of interest to the participants uh, in this webinar. Uh, the scope in that report was a bit broader since it examined uh, green technology disputes and not only energy disputes. But to summarize some of the findings which might be of interest uh, in this webinar, the uh, report first looked at uh, SSC commercial cases, which were initiated between 2014 and 2018 and found that in the green technology cases registered during that period, 61% uh, of the parties pursued activities in the renewable energy sector. In those cases, we saw that uh, the claims mostly concerned damages for non-delivery and also failure to pay for delivery. Uh, and it included both technical disputes, such as the case concerning software systems relating to wind turbines and non-technical disputes, such as uh, unpaid deliveries of um, uh, components to, to uh, uh, wind power structures. Uh, what we saw here was also that the report confirmed what has already been said a few times during uh, our respective presentations. The amount in dispute was quite high in the commercial cases. The average was 14 million euros. Uh, and then the report also looked at investment treaty disputes where the investor had an investment in the green technology sector in the host state's territory. And what we saw in those cases was that 14 out of 16 cases concerned investments in solar power, while the other two concerned investments in wind energy. And in these cases, the amount in dispute was on average even higher, amounting to an average of 88 million euros. So, so I think being mindful of the time that I will stop there and, and open up the uh, uh, the panel and the floor for further discussions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Christopher. Thanks a lot for everything you have told us, especially for the, the effort you have made on the statistics. In fact, I was quite impressed by the, this uh, from 2001. I mean, you have offered us some interesting statistics. I'm sure that Melanie, who has been working at the same time, who has been listening to you, and I have seen she has sent us some of the links we need to follow your explanation. So uh, thank you very much. And before uh, taking uh, back the floor, I will tell, I will ask Melanie if she would like to, to, to have some questions. I give you the floor and then at the end, of the end I, I might have, have, if I have time to make one, very, one or two questions, but then you have the floor first, Melanie. Yes, um, 
uh, since we said this um, seminar was, was going to last uh, an hour, we don't have that much time, uh, but um, I'm happy to inform that we have answered all the questions in the QR um, chat. So no questions uh, that we need to, to address for now. Congratulations. So I will tell you, I will say the final word. I will again apologize for uh, Jose Antonio Cainzos, the chairman of the MIAC, not being present. And I will thank him for not being present because thanks to that, I have been with you. If not, I would have been just one more follower. And my two points will be ask uh, first, uh, Christine and uh, Melanie to work on future cooperation projects. And I hope one of them brings uh, Christine to Madrid or Melanie to, to Stockholm. That will be, as an ambassador, will be so happy that these links strengthen more and more. And secondly, I will ask uh, Christopher and also Juan to, to try to work together because Spain, as uh, Juan Ignacio knows better than I do, has been quite, uh, I mean, not suffering, but we have been very active in, the, in the energy cases, as you well know. And I have seen that Christopher has a very large knowledge of what the, this area offers us. So I'm sure out of this today's uh, webinar, uh, I think we are starting a, a period of cooperation between MIAC and, and SCC, and uh, you count on me for anything you might need. I mean, as you know, I'm just a retired diplomat. So, I, but anyway, I will be very happy to to be able to see you both again in, in some other event. Thanks a lot, and Melanie, especially to you and to your team, to Mariano because I think it has worked technical, technological. Christine has learned a lot because at the other time she was telling us she didn't know how to move the, and now she's uh, to, uh, teaching Christopher how to do it. So congratulations, <laughs> you have done a wonderful job. Thanks a lot. If uh, you have anything more to say, you say it, and it's not farewell for all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.